Chris, last time we talked, it was immediately after the election. Uh, two years into Trump's presidency, give us an assessment of how Trump has further deteriorated the last vestiges of our democratic institutions. Right. I would argue that it's not Trump who has uh, accelerated the deterioration of our democratic institutions, but by uh, all of those forces within the political establishment, and I would argue the press, that it, are tasked with defending an open society. They've failed us. I mean, Trump, if the rule of law was in place, could have been impeached on the first day he took the presidency under the emoluments clause. He's utterly shameless about Mar-a-Lago or the Trump Hotel in Washington, uh, which is uh, raking in millions of dollars from lobbyists and foreign governments. In fact, he, uh, in the publicity material, puts out uh, the information that you may be able to get your picture with the president if you go to his one of his golf courses. Or so um, it, it's the it's the breakdown of the rule of law, the uh, you know the inability on the part of decayed and anemic institutions, which predated Trump. Um, so uh, he's clearly committed obstruction of justice, uh, for instance, on innumerable. Uh, policy decisions such as uh, moving behind the scenes to allow Saudi Arabia uh, to build nuclear reactors. Um, this can only be uh, under law approved by Congress. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, so just on and on and on. It's an evisceration of the rule of law, which is what despots or demagogues do, but they are empowered by a democratic society or failed democracy that no longer does what it's tasked to do, which is defend the rule of law. So it's Mitch McConnell, it's the Democrats, and let's be clear, the Democrats kind of want Trump in 2020. Um, the, I think they're very misguided, but they think they can cough up uh, a figure like Joe Biden, who's just sort of a goofy male version of Hillary Clinton, uh, and uh, and use that playbook. I, I don't think it's going to work. Um, there are systemic uh, issues uh, that are actually far more serious than Trump himself. Right. It's interesting that they're putting forward Joe Biden because Obama picked him specifically to pander to Republicans, and they're actually audacious. Obama did a pretty good job of pandering to Republicans, yeah. too, of course, um, especially the banking sector uh, and, the, <laughs> and the war industry <laughs> and, you know, the intelligence agencies. And, um, uh, yeah, well... The, the problem is that the democratic elite, which is a creation of corporate power, um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the more acceptable face of corporate power. They're mm -hmm. not naked misogynists, although Biden, look at Anita Hill, and um, uh, they, they are not open, openly Islamophobes or racists. Uh, although, of course, the structures that they support oppress women, especially poor women, oppress people of color. Um, Biden was instrumental, along with Clinton, in, in more than doubling our prison population. And people forget <clears throat> tripling or quadrupling the length of sentences. And uh, half of our prison population have never been charged with physically harming another person. 94% uh, of them never got a jury trial. I mean, it's really, it is the latest iteration of slavery, neo-slavery. And the Democrats, uh, because they wanted, uh, and Biden was at the epicenter of this, to seize back the law and order issue from the public, Republicans created it. So, um, but the Democrats are terrified of Sanders and Warren, although I find them very tepid figures. Um, and if we look at history, we will see that uh, even the whiff of socialism uh, uh, has always seen the uh, business elites, uh, the industrial class, make an alliance with the fascists. This was certainly was always a very uncomfortable relationship between the German industrialists and the uh, Nazis, who were a, an array of buffoonish characters, including Hitler, who couldn't even speak proper German. Um, uh, and it's an uncomfortable relationship, but they'd far rather that relationship than uh, see the rise of any social movement which will impede um, their 
further consolidation of power and their further consolidation of profits. So we have to remember that uh, when Trump came into office, what did he do? He turned to the most powerful forces within the corporate state, um, tax cuts, uh, which saw Amazon, which would they make $10 billion worth of profits. They paid no income taxes. Uh, he boosted the military spending, even though they didn't even ask for it, uh, by 10 percent. And he uh, empowered the intelligence agencies uh, to uh, uh, carry out activities, as we see it especially with immigrants and undocumented workers, um, which uh, brings us closer and closer to a police state. So he placated those forces. Um, and however repugnant they may find Trump to be, and I think that many of them do, the kind of uh, Princeton graduates who run old and work at Goldman Sachs, for instance, and would love to put a more acceptable face uh, like Biden, somebody who will carry out their bidding with more decorum, um, they'll nevertheless work with him as they have worked with him. And the war on terror has, of course, supercharged or turbocharged this entire kind of evisceration of the rule of law. Um, you were a main plaintiff Hedges versus Obama um, to sue the Obama administration for the National Defense Authorization Act in 2012. And you and others at the time were arguing it wasn't that necessarily Obama was going to use this. It was someone like right. a Trump. Sure. I mean, you don't want to hand that kind of power to the government. Uh, Obama, uh, when he, uh, and essentially what Section 1021 does is it overturns the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibits the military from being used as a domestic police force. Um, under that Section 1021, uh, the military can seize, in the language of that section, uh, people who are identified with being uh, with a Taliban. Uh, al-Qaeda or quote-unquote associated forces, whatever that is, and putting them in military detention facilities, uh, including our offshore penal colonies, without giving them access to due process or habeas corpus or anything else. Uh, and they refuse to hear the case, so it's law. But what's interesting is that in the meantime, the lawyers, Bruce Afron and Karl Mayer, reached out to the Democratic Party leadership and said, because it's renewed every year, said all you have to do is write in there that it doesn't uh, apply to U.S. citizens and we drop the lawsuit. But of course they didn't write that in because it was written for U.S. citizens. Um, <laughs> so I think it's because they ultimately, you know, the NSA and they've all run scenarios about the effects of societal breakdown, uh, whether centered around catastrophic uh, climate uh, disruption or a uh, financial, uh, financial crash. I mean, uh, and they felt that they needed the military as an instrument, uh, which clearly a figure like Trump will use, and not only use, but authorized to use lethal force. The GOP was collapsing before they were able to yeah, latch on to Trump. So right. I guess that's where I'm worried things are going. They know Trump is really kind of their last hope. I don't know if they can really win without him. I mean, and he's been throwing out these trial balloons of not wanting to leave the presidency in eight years. Right. We know the state of the Democratic Party. Right. So it is getting more extreme and potentially more desperate. And we're zero 9-11s away from actually something very bad happening. In well, or an economic through. crash would be, yeah. you know, to serve the same purpose, a crisis. These, you know, totalitarian groups always need to consolidate their power through a crisis, like the Reichstag fire or mm -hmm. something. So, um, I mean, both parties destroyed. Ne neither the Democrats or mm -hmm. the Republicans function as traditional parties. The base has no relevance. The You can't even get on the DNC unless you're a superdelegate, mm -hmm. which means you're a lobbyist or, you know, the stooge who works for a lobbyist or something. So neither of them function as political parties. And the Republican Party, which was pushing through all sorts of policies which have, have no support within, with the majority of the public, um, I mean, you notice now they're not talking much about the tax cuts. So it, they've, they've pushed the culture wars, abortion, homosexuality, uh, immigrants, etc. Um, and they kind of set the stage for a figure uh, like Trump because – uh, the actual policies that they engage in, like the Democrats, most Americans don't want. And so the parties have had to retreat into, now we have a gay candidate, now we have a woman candidate, mm -hmm. now 
and, and not that it's not important to empower disenfranchised groups, um, but it it you know becomes like Cornell West said of Obama, he's just a black mascot for Wall Street. It, it's a piece of advertising, and and the real fundamental issues which both parties agree on. Let's remember that 90 plus percent of everything that's carried out is bipartisan. Right. Completely bipartisan. But but MSNBC and Fox, they're not going to talk about that, and neither is CNN, uh, because they need to create this arena-like uh, situation where there's a constant enmity and you can never come to a consensus uh, and it's a kind of mortal battle to the death for the soul of the <laughs> republic. That's what, it, but it's all fiction because in almost every issue, there is no difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, we're in a very, very serious moment in American history, um, where I, I don't see certainly, uh, you know, through the electoral system, there's no way out. Um, we are headed eventually towards another financial dislocation. How I'm not an economist. I don't know how severe, but Goldman Sachs and Citibank, they're all back to doing what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. um, these bubbles are not sustainable. But anyway, a crisis like that will certainly, uh, I mean, that's when the monsters will really come out. We already have a president who openly incites violence. But you get people to think and, and speak in the language of violence. It doesn't take very long until that violence begins to characterize your society. And we're already seeing it with uh, the mass shootings at synagogues. And uh, we had a misguided guy living out of a van in Florida send pipe bombs, which if they'd gone off would have decapitated most of the Democratic Party leadership. Let's talk more about the rhetoric um, of Trump today. I mean, at a rally the other day, he was kind of laughing at someone bringing up, hey, let's just shoot the immigrants yeah, at the border. Only in the panhandle. Yeah, only in the panhandle. And then you have just this open incitement to violence, essentially, yeah. against the two sitting Muslim congresswomen. Yeah. When you uh, get people to speak in this language, um, it's finally a very short step to carrying out violence itself. And it's often, uh, in, in a dark kind of way, humorous. Um, so you see Trump at a rally, and somebody shouts, shoot him, and he says, only in the panhandle. Um, but eventually, they start getting shot. Well, they already are, but they start getting shot en masse in the panhandle. Um, you demonize a figure like Ilhan Omar, uh, and eventually, hopefully not, but somebody like her or she gets shot. I mean, th there are consequences to uh, lustily advocating and embracing violence, which Trump again, is openly doing with no, there's no external restraint. Uh, and because the broadcast media uh, loves Trump, he's the, he's kind of the perfect foil. Um, his stuff is, you know, these kinds of taunts are just disseminated throughout the country. It, it's eerie for someone like me who has covered for 20 years disintegrating societies, including the war in El Salvador, uh, or the former Yugoslavia, just, just watch a kind of all of those patterns being repeated with, with, with nobody standing up. You know, it's that Auden line, the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity with, you know, all of those people who should be standing up, not standing up to, to try and halt it. Mm -hmm. You've warned about Christianized fascism taking root. Right. Just looking at the judges that Trump has appointed, I think more than any other president at this point in his That's term, right. I, it is interesting to me that the Democrats are not more um, up in arms about this. You know, we heard a lot about Kavanaugh, but what about all these other judges who are now in there for lifetime appointments? Talk about the significance of that alone. Well, th that's very important because the I think the judiciary has been the last readout, uh, the last kind of barrier towards this corporate totalitarianism. And now that's been eviscerated, especially with Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court. Um, let's not forget that Obama's appointments, now many of them were blocked, but Obama's appointments to the federal courts were uh, not very good. They were all corporatists as well. Um, they were a kind of, you know, it was uh, what, that book, Friendly Fascism. I mean, they were mm -hmm. a more palatable form of 
I suppose, corporate fascism. But they, uh, they, they came out of corporate law. And what you're getting now is ideologically driven uh, judges uh, approved by the Federalist Society, mm -hmm. embraced by the Christian right. I mean, the reason Trump had to push Kavanaugh through so quickly is because the Christian right was worried that if Trump lost control of the Congress, they wouldn't be able to get Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court, uh, who, despite what Susan Collins told us, is there to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, originally, he wasn't even on the list. He was, you know, uh, uh, he was promoted to the number one pick by that base. So Trump, and, and I think I said this before last time I was here, I mean, he has no ideology of his own. He's, there's an ideological void. Um, but this Christian fascism is rapidly filling it, and it's, we've seen the advance of these Christian fascists in the, the uh, figures like Mike Pompeo, uh, uh, John Bolton, Elliot Abrams. Uh, they come out of this very fra—I knew Elliot Abrams. I, I had to deal with them when I covered uh, the wars in Central America in the 80s. I mean, these are— uh, uh, very frightening figures who either are unwilling or incapable of uh, understanding nuance. They're not uh, literate historically or culturally. Um, they believe exclusively in the language of violence, the language of force. Um, we're watching the, you know, the, these efforts along with Bibi Netanyahu to push us into a war with Iran, which is I, I spent seven years in the Middle East and a lot of time in Iran. This is just utter uh, insanity. And a lot um, of them believe literally in the Bible. I mean, Mike Pompeo sure. said that everything that he's doing is for the rapture. Right, and Pence. And, you know, this Betsy DeVos pushes charter schools because uh, she once said it's good for the kingdom, i.e. you give federal money to Christian fascists to indoctrinate children in Christian schools. And uh, as you know, I come out of a deep <laughs> religious tradition I'm a graduate of Harvard Divinity School. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't like labels too much, but I certainly uh, remain rooted in that tradition. I don't use the word fascist lightly. Um, these people have fused the iconography and language of the state uh, with that of the Bible. They've sacralized um, state power, state chauvinism, um, and they are a highly organized, well-funded, and disciplined force. Those of us who are not hooked into that community don't see it, but tens of millions of Americans are indoctrinated through Christian schools and Christian broadcasting and Christian media and megachurches, which are just mini versions of the kind of narcissistic cults uh, that Trump has now set up in the White House. Other than the language of force, what you know, what characterizes them as fascists? A, a binary view of the world, a, a separation of the world into us and them, good and evil, black and white. Uh, but fundamentally, an externalization of evil, a belief that, you know, those of us who come out of, uh, a, a, you know, I think a religious tradition that isn't fascistic, understand that the, the greatest evil is within us. Something I learned as a war correspondent, that that line between the victim and the victimizer is razor thin. We are all capable, without a lot of prodding, uh, to become the torturer. Um, and it is that knowledge of our own capacity for evil which allows us to constantly fight against it. These people have, for them, evil is embodied in the other who must be eradicated the jihadist, the, the Muslim, the uh, immigrant. Uh, and it, it is the sick belief that when you eradicate uh, this segment of the population uh, or these people, somehow evil is eradicated. Except, of course, it doesn't work like that. Um, you, you, you need a new entity to demonize because this is a, a, an ideology based on hate, really. And uh, it is about the sanctification of American power um, and white supremacy. I mean, I spent 20 years abroad, and if you look at the conflicts, I was in Central America, the Middle East, and those are really ex the external expressions of white supremacy. 
Um, so it is uh, that inability to be self-critical. It is at its core about self-exaltation. Um, it is the inability for them to struggle with the, the, the darkness that is within all of us, that is part of the human condition, and the belief that violence is a form of purification. And it is the sacralization of, of nationalism and nationalist symbols. And, and, and we have some of the stalwarts, I mean, Pence and others, who come out of this uh, very frightening worldview. And I think a lot of Americans who have not been uh, in its grip don't understand how dangerous it is. Back to the language of, of Trump that's kind of bringing us to that permanent lie that you talk about, as opposed to these half-truths right. which defined political discourse in the past. Elaborate on what you mean by that. Well, so totalitarian systems, or this is Hannah Arendt, are always engaged in the permanent lie as opposed to the expedient lie. Politicians always lie, as I have spoken, said, all governments lie. So Clinton wants to shove NAFTA down our throat and tells us it will create millions of wonderful, well-paying jobs, and, um, but it doesn't. <laughs> uh, George W. Bush tells us that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, except there weren't. Well, Bush and Clinton don't run around now saying that you know, NAFTA created millions of jobs, and Bush doesn't say that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The permanent lie uh, has no fealty to the truth at all. Um, and it becomes kind of schizophrenic because even what in a totalitarian system you see in front of you is denied. It doesn't matter how many pictures Trump shows of the inauguration crowd, his was the largest in history. I mean, that that's the permanent lie. And that's certainly another aspect of the kind of uh, despotism that is enveloped, has enveloped the country because that's how he operates. And it, it's different from the expedient lie. And it, 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 it knocks people off balance because there's just no, uh, you cannot have any discourse that anymore is grounded in verifiable fact or reality. You, you, that's another step towards tyranny. Well, a lot of these people will say um, they're patriotic. Chris, they're not white nationalists. They're not nationalists. Of course, that has a negative connotation. I mean, is there a difference when you're looking at nationalism versus patriotism? Sure. I would define patriotism as those activities or activity which makes your country and your community a better place. So for me, probably you could argue the greatest patriot of the 20th century was Martin Luther King. Uh, but patriotism has been perverted into a deification of the warrior class. Uh, nationalism is a disease, and I watched nationalist and covered nationalist movements around the globe. So after 9-11, we drank dark, that very dark elixir of nationalism, uh, which is always racist and always about self-exaltation at the expense of the other. You know, that when a country's convulsed by that kind of, in, you know, intoxication with nationalism, um, it is... It is a temporary overcoming of the anomie or the dislocation or the despair or the alienation that much of the country feels. It's a false kind of camaraderie. Um, but suddenly people feel that they're part of a cause. They feel that they belong again. And intellectuals are some of the most susceptible to this. And I was fighting these people. I was teaching at Princeton at the time. Uh, and they were, they, you know, they drank this Kool-Aid as deeply as everyone else. So um, it it uh, creates a situation where the critics, and I was one, um, are, uh, are not just expressing another opinion, even though, of course, I'd come out of seven years out of the Middle East, but you are actually attacking their right to exalt themselves. So when I was denouncing the calls to invade Iraq publicly, um, I would come into the New York Times and my, the phone messaging bank would be full of death threats. Wow. And it was that. It was these people who had been gripped by this anime and had found in this cause a way. Uh, it, it was, it, it's a kind of false route because it doesn't work in the end, but a way to reintegrate into a society that had turned against them. And anybody who challenged that suddenly, it was an existential challenge. It just wasn't a political challenge. You know, getting rid of Trump doesn't solve the problem. As Noam Chomsky has pointed out, Pence will be worse, and Noam is right. Um, there are uh, 
uh, you know, we are a deeply diseased society. And my last book, which was America, the Farewell Tour, which is pulled from Durkheim, is about what Durkheim calls that anime, the breaking of those social bonds that, as Durkheim, the great French sociologist, writes, uh, creates uh, a system whereby people engage in self-destructive behavior, whether that's the opioid uh, crisis, suicide, um, gambling is another one. Uh, when I wrote her out of the Trump Taj before Trump even announced. But also, as Durkheim correctly points out, hate groups, because he says those who fervently seek the annihilation of others are really driven by longings for self-annihilation. And I write a chapter, I'm with the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters. So if we don't address that anime, if we don't arrest, address the rupture of the social bonds <laughs> that allows for a healthy society, um, getting rid of Trump ain't gonna make any difference. But how can the left ever challenge what is going on, this, this kind of decay institutionally, if the system rewards those that are horrible? The powerful are the greedy. They'll step on you and they'll kill you to get to the top. I mean, right. how does the left have a chance? Disconnecting from the system. And, uh, you know, it's, it's Alexander Harrison's great line, speaking to a bunch of revolutionaries, you know, uh, we think we're the doctor, we're the disease. We have to destroy the system. Uh, and that means mass civil disobedience. It means non-cooperation. Uh, it means obstructing in every way possible uh, the ability of this system to function. That's our only hope. And we don't, you know, climate change alone uh, means the, that window is closing very, very swiftly. These people will kill us. Um, and um, they will carry, in the end, carry out crimes of humanity that make what the Nazis or the Stalinists did look like child's play. Um, they're, they're, they are now pushing us towards the complete extinction of the human species. Um, and nothing will stop them because they are, they are psychopathic uh, figures who um, believe only in their own personal enrichment. Uh, at the expense, I mean, Mike Pompeo is cheering the melting of the polar ice caps because it will expose natural resources. Um, I mean, not only do you not want people like Pompeo and others to be in positions of leadership, um, but they are a guarantor that you and certainly your children um, will uh, suffer tremendous misery and early death. And, um, we can't play games with these people anymore.